Rene Descartes, whose name I cannot pronounce properly for the sake of my life. Please do forgive me, but I'll try my best. But anyways, Rene Descartes, he wrote The Meditations on First Philosophy, which stands as one of the most influential philosophical works in history. And it was written, written, oh my God, we're off to a fantastic start, aren't we? Written in the mid-17th century. This series of meditations presents Descartes' quest for certainty and knowledge and his methodical doubt, which lays the groundwork for modern philosophy. Now, through convincing arguments and profound insights, Descartes challenges traditional beliefs and constructs a new framework for understanding reality. Now, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and explain each meditation in detail. So we'll talk about the first meditation, which is Doubt and Certainty. And uh, Descartes embarks on his philosophical journey by embracing radical doubt, questioning the reliability of his senses and knowledge acquired through them. And he realizes that sensory perceptions can deceive, leading to false beliefs. So, to establish a solid foundation for knowledge, he employs the method of doubt, systematically doubting everything until he reaches an unquestionable truth. And he has a quote, and he says, So serious are the doubts into which I have been thrown as a result of yesterday's meditation, that I can neither put them out of my mind, nor see any way of resolving them. So, at the core of Descartes' method is radical doubt. He begins by subjecting all his beliefs to scepticism, aiming to rid, of, rid himself of any preconceived notions that may cloud his search for truth. Descartes famously declares in his first meditation, I have persuaded myself that there is nothing in the world, no sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Does it now follow that I too do not exist? No, if I persuaded myself of something, then I certainly existed. But there is, de there is a deceiver of supreme power and cunning who is deliberately and constantly deceiving me. And this doubt serves as a tool to strip away layers of uncertainty, leaving only that which is unquestionable. And then moving on to the second meditation, which is the Kokito, or if you really want me to become Latin, Kogito, I don't know. Okay, but people usually call it Kogito. And in the second meditation, Descartes, Descartes <laughs> discovers the first unquestionable truth, Kogito ergo sum. Or I think, therefore I am. By doubting, he recognizes that even the act of doubting assumes a thinking self, right? Thus, the existence of the thinking self or the ego becomes the foundation upon which all knowledge can be built. This cogito serves as the bedrock of Cartesian philosophy, offering certainty amidst the sea of doubt. Or, as he says, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. Descartes' ultimate aim in the meditations is to establish a foundation of certainty upon which he can build his system of knowledge. He seeks a truth that is immune to skepticism, something that cannot be doubted. And in the second meditation, Descartes arrives at this conclusion, recognizing that even if all his sensory perceptions and beliefs are deceptive, the very act of doubting assumes the existence of a doubter. Thus, the certainty of one's own existence becomes the bedrock upon which Descartes builds his philosophical structure. And then the third meditation, which is the existence of God. Building upon the certainty of the cogito, Descartes aims to establish the existence of God. And he argues that the idea of a perfect being, namely God, cannot originate from his finite and imperfect self. Therefore, it must be implanted by a perfect and infinite being, which he identifies as God. Furthermore, Descartes asserts that God's existence guarantees the reliability of clear and distinct perceptions, laying the groundwork for a trustworthy reality, or as he says, 
Certainly, the idea of God or a supremely perfect being is one that I find within me just as surely as the idea of any shape or number. And then we have the fourth meditation, which is the veracity of God. And in the fourth meditation, Descartes examines the nature of truth and deception, introducing the concept of the evil genius or the evil demon. And he entertains the possibility that an almighty and malicious deceiver could manipulate his perceptions, casting doubt on the reliability of clear and distinct ideas. However, Descartes contends that God, of course, being kind and truthful, would not allow systematic deception. Thus, despite the potential deception by the evil genius, Descartes maintains his trust in clear and distinct perceptions due to the veracity of God. And he says, But perhaps God has not willed that I should be so often deceived, for he has given me no faculty at all for recognizing the truth in things. And then in the fifth meditation, he talks about the essence of material things. Turning his attention to the external world, Descartes investigates the nature of material things. He distinguishes between the mind, which is a thinking substance, and the body, which is an extended substance. While the mind is known with certainty through introspection, the existence of the external world, including material bodies, is inferred from clear and distinct perceptions. Descartes suggests that the essence of material things lies in their extension, which can be mathematically described, paving the way for a mechanistic understanding of the physical universe. And he says, All that remains to be done to satisfy this is to examine with attention all the things that are commonly believed to be most perfectly known. Moving on to the sixth meditation, dualism and the unity of body and mind. In the final meditation, Descartes addresses the mind-body problem, proposing Cartesian dualism. The view that mind and body are distinct substances. While the mind is a thinking substance devoid of extension, the body is an extended substance devoid of thought. Yet they interact through the pineal gland, a notion that has been subject to criticism and debate. Despite the ontological distinction between mind and body, Descartes emphasizes their unity within the human being, underscoring the intimate relationship between mental and physical phenomena. And he says, I think it is easy to see from the proceeding that the true distinction between the mind and the body consists in the fact that the mind is a thinking non-extended thing, whereas the body is an extended non-thinking thing.